what I wanted to do between myself and, and probably Renika as well here, well, she's on that side as well, she's going to help me out here, is she's going to do very briefly uh, just a, a little bit about what's come in published research, just influence a little bit about what we've said today, and then an update on the Treat Warfarin clinical trial, and then a bit of an update on, on other future trials that, that hopefully are in the pipeline. Some of it's reprising what was talked at the International Warfarin meeting last week, but uh, looking down the list, I don't think that many of you were at that, so hopefully I'm not repeating to too many people. Federica accepted, because I think you were there as well, but I'll do my best in a moment. So, first of all, I, I picked out four articles, uh, sorry, three articles, because they're relevant to, um, to, to treatments that are coming. And this, and this first one uh, was published about a year ago by the Japanese group at the moment, looking at new treatments uh, for different types of, of warfarin. And they've got um, cell models from people with orphan, from skin biopsies and things like that. And they've tested two drugs. One of them I'm interested in, sodium valparate, because that's the treat orphan trial. Another one, 4-phenobutyrate, is, is interested to other colleagues that are here from the pharmaceutical companies here today, uh, and, and Alexa <coughs> as well. Um, and what's already known, what was already known about this is that one of the underlying mechanisms in Wolfram is something called endoplasmic reticulum stress. And we've been talking about stress uh, a lot of the morning there and how to avoid it as well. And we also know that there are drugs already available that can relieve this stress and can improve it. And two of these drugs are, are, are thought to be 4-phenobutyrate and, as I said, valparate. So what they did is they took the cell models from people's skin and, and grew those up and there were particular people with a special form of inheritance called dominant inheritance. So these are some people with Wolfram uh, where it's passed from one generation to the next in a slightly different way. And they've got two copies of the Wolfram gene, but only one of them's got a mistake in it. But the copy with a mistake in it um, inhibits the, other, the, other, the, the good copy from working. So it works in a slightly different way, but the underlying mechanism is still stressed. They, they bathe these cells in the medicines they had, and what they found was that both of these medicines could relieve that stress on those cells, and more of those cells would, cells would survive in that model. So it was really, really um, reassuring, I think, from our treat orphan point of view, and probably from Amalexis as well and others, is that these medicines do look like they are good candidates to treat the underlying mechanism in Wolfram. And so that's a good reason for trying to take them into clinical trials we're doing at the moment. So that sort of reassuring and confirmatory that hopefully we're along, along the right lines. The second one, uh, which was actually another model, these are colleagues in Estonia, uh, and Mario Plas and others as well, looked at a medicine for diabetes that you've probably all heard of, liraglutide. Some people have been probably using it for treatment. Um, and another medicine called brain-derived neurotropic factor. So this is an analog. So this is a medicine that helps brain cells grow and regenerate, um, and it's uh, available. Dr. Fumi Arana has done some work in it, and others as well. So it's already known that liraglutide and brain-derived neurotrophic factor seem to be able to protect vision um, in, in animal models, in mouse models, and perhaps with animals as well. But they've not sort of been tried together. Can we grab a drink of water? Drink of water for yeah. Drink of water. Yeah. Um, but they've not been tried together. Um, and they do seem to protect memory there as well. So what they did is they took their model of Wolfram, so this is a, a rat model of Wolfram, and they treated the rats with the drugs separately and then the drugs together. And what they found was that the best results they had is if you give people the regulatide and the brain-derived neurotrophic factor, it slowed down the loss of vision in, in these rats and seems to stabilize it. Now the reason that's important is for those of us thinking about how we're going to design a clinical study in the future, we need to think about studies with combinations of medicines, not one medicine at a time. And that would be quicker to try and find a treatment than just testing one medicine and then another medicine and then another medicine. So a future trial hopefully will be a combination of treatments in one go. So different trial designs to improve. And again, that's relevant to Amalex and what, what you were talking about earlier on. And the final one I, I, I put up, partly for Federica as well, because it's from the Italian group on here as well. So this is uh, Ia Fusco and others from, from Milan. And what they've done is um, they were following up people who've had Wolfram from childhood into adulthood, 
following them up from there and looking at treatments. And what's already known from this is that we know that Wolfram affects different parts of the body and we've done research studies um, and, and shown effects in a snapshot, but there haven't been that many studies cross-sectional following people up in long term. There have been some. So what they did is they reported the long-term follow-up of children's becoming adults over about 15 years uh, in their clinic in, in Milan, particularly looking at diabetes. And they've got data on 15, so not, not as many patients as in St. Louis, but still interesting. They've got nice clinical data. And what they found was in those 15 people, those people who had really, really good diabetes control uh, after 15 years seemed to have better vision um, and better balance than people who had had poor diabetes control over that time. So there seems to be a relation between sugar control and, and the risks of developing the longer term complications. And this fits in with work done in Germany about 10 years ago now by Dr. Julia Rohan that suggested that uh, there was also this association between good sugar control and, and better longer term outcomes than others. So what the study adds is that if we can improve diabetes control, we might be able to slow the progression of some other bits of Wolfram outside the diabetes that's relevant. And that's why we spent a lot of the meeting today talking about glucose monitors, glucose pumps, and how to try and avoid very low sugars here as part of it as well. So that, that's the reason for it. Now that paper is free on PubMed. And what I can do is I can ask um, uh, Tracy or others in terms of the website, we can put a link on the Wolfram Syndrome UK website if people would like to read it, because it's quite a readable paper. It's quite easy to read as well. Do that. Right, so that was that. So then the next bit was update on the Tree Wolfram trial, which some of you have been, or some of you are taking part in as well. And I'll go through in terms of why we're doing it, why we've chosen the medicine we have, uh, what are participants being asked to do, where we are at the moment, um, and then what happens at the end of the trial. And I've got two pictures up here. One, Stephanie will know very well, uh, my, my mentor and hero, Professor Alan Permit, um, who is really the person who discovered the gene for Wolfram syndrome back in 1998, and who had always been incredibly kind um, and supportive to me as a very junior researcher into the field when he'd been working on diabetes for many years. And, uh, uh, sadly died just a few years ago. And then my PhD supervisor, Professor Sarah Bundy, who's a genetics consultant and professor in Birmingham, who actually, um, I, I was knocking on doors around Birmingham, desperate to do some research, and I couldn't find anybody who would take me on. She's the only person um, who said, well, I've got this interesting condition, and we don't know what the cause is, and would you like to try and investigate it? And in that days, it was called Didmo syndrome, and it was her help and support that, that helped me to do a PhD, and. Um, uh, go around the, the country finding families and talking to people with Wolfram. It got me interested in uh, quite a number of years ago. So, I borrowed this slide from Professor Fumi, um, who showed it last Saturday, at that point, in, at the pathway of where people are trying to develop treatments <laughs> for Wolfram. And it goes from left to right. Some people are trying to do gene therapy by trying to correct the gene mistake on that side. Uh, or correct the variants in those, um, or indeed actually trans transplant different tissues. And then it, the middle bit here, which is ongoing, where uh, Amelix and others are interested in actually trying to uh, trying to uh, address and demand um, the protein product from here, onto drug treatments, which again is relative to, to, to Amelix, the dantrolene sodium and liraglutide, which are there to try and actually deal with the stress uh, at that end, over to sodium valproate, which fits in on the right hand side, trying to ameliorate the ER stress, improve the protein, but also reduce the cell death. So that's a sort of a map, really, from left to right, about where different initiatives are going on at the moment. And the bit that um, I, I'll talk about here is the sodium valproate bit on the right. So that, that's where that is. So um, with a, with a apologise to Fumi and Steph, you can say that I've well, I borrowed this slide for today's talk as well to see that. So, like Dr. Renica and, my, uh, and myself, we're both children's endocrine doctors and children's diabetes doctors, and we love doing clinical trials in diabetes because that's what we know about, particularly uh, in that area. Uh, and I was looking forward to doing a trial to try and um, treat the diabetes in Wolfram syndrome, but fairly early on, 
we actually went to um, the Snow Foundation, uh, French Wolfram, Spanish Wolfram and Wolframson in the UK and said, please, as families, what, what, what do you think is most important? And I should have realised vision is far more important to families than diabetes is because you can treat diabetes with insulin but the vision is something that you can't fix so easily. And every patient support group, without fail, put vision as the number one thing to try and do something about. So we had to reorientate ourselves away from diabetes and think, can we do a clinical trial that will help the, 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 the brain issues and the vision issues for it? So that's why we've, we've gone down that route. And then we had to think, how, how can we measure something? What, what's measurable that can be a real outcome for a trial that we can show will make a difference? And that's where um, Professor Tammy uh, Hershey came in and very kindly shared the data from the St. Louis Research Clinic on 21 or so um, young people with Wolfram who were followed up over a number of years to look at their vision. And the picture that I'm showing uh, on the left or the, the, the uh, y-axis shows that for a vision of naught, uh, that is 20-20 vision or perfect vision, and of a vision of two on the log mask scale here, that's a vision where you can see light and dark and you can count fingers, but you can't make out faces so clearly either. And each individual coloured line is following up an individual person in the Wolfram <coughs> St. Louis clinic over a number of years, and all the lines go from the bottom left to the top right, showing that over time, vision does deteriorate, but in a predictable way. And you can draw a line or a regression line through the middle of it and predict uh, how quickly time with, with uh, um, vision will change over time. And what we thought was, if we can make a difference, if we can slow down that rate of loss by half, that would mean that people who show early signs of optic atrophy in childhood will still have useful vision going into their 20s, 30s, better than at the moment. And that means they'll have useful vision all the way through school, higher education, university, and into, into early adulthood. So we thought, how many people would we need a trial to, in order to show an outcome that would improve the vision by, by half? Um, and with some very helpful, some helpful statistics and some clever statistical methods, we worked out we needed between 60 and 70 people to take part in a clinical trial to be able to get to that outcome. We've done. So uh, we thought that would be achievable in Europe, but we couldn't do that in England alone because that there aren't enough people who'd be eligible to take part. So we needed to involve European partners as well. So we went to colleagues in Spain, France, and uh, Poland to do that. And then we had to find a treatment. We had to find a, a medicine to try this with. And so we went for sodium vaporate for a number of different, different reasons. Um, first of all, our cell models of Wolfram that we did um, looked at the cell cycle, which I've got a, a picture of that we've got on here. Um, we, we, we were looking at cells, uh, every cell in the body um, will, will grow, develop, and then divide and reproduce. And if it's unhealthy or it's uh, stressed, instead of dividing and reproducing, it goes down a cell death route. Now that circle of a cell life cycle is controlled by regulators, these little, little men on the picture here as well. And these little regulators, when they work, can hold the cell in a certain part and stop it uh, going off into cell death or, 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 or dying. In our cell model in Wolfram, one of these regulators was, was reduced, it had low levels in it, but in cells that kept it, they stayed alive and they stayed healthy. So we thought, if we can find medicines that will bump up this cell regulator here, it can hold cells in a stable position to let them recover and stop them going into cell death. And our drug screen did that, and the drug that we found that did that was sodium valparate, it would help with it. Now the nice thing about sodium valparate is it's been around for about 50 years now. There's over 3,000 papers in the, in the literature talking about its use and effects on the brain. And it's been used to treat epilepsy in millions of children and adults for over 40 years. So we know what the safety profile is. We know it can get into the brain, so therefore it should be able to help protect brain cells. Um, we know it's what's called a neuroprotective agent, so it helps brain cells recover. And some data from our French colleagues show that it can help, shoot, help cell brain cells grow a bit again as well. We know it can treat the underlying mechanism because Fumi and others as well have published and shown that it can treat the stress in enterprise in particular. And importantly for me as a children's doctor, it's licensed for use in children as well as adults. So we could look at a clinical trial of this 
for children and adults all in one go. So what we tried to do, talking to the regulators, was to do one trial with all the information that would be needed so that if it works, we can go straight to the regulators and get it approved for use. What we don't want to do is a phase one and a phase two and a phase three trial, where it's all in one go to try and get that, get that done. So we went to the European Medicines Agency, Protocol Assistance Committee, and they advised on the sort of trial we would need to do. And this was 2015 now, so it was a while ago. Um, unfortunately for us, they said, you've got to do this gold standard randomized controlled trial. And just to remind you, that, that means that on a toss of a coin, people get allocated to treatment or dummy treatment. Um, and the people who take part are not allowed to know which they're, they're having, and the doctors who are doing it are not allowed to know which they're having. And they said that's the gold standard, so that if it works, there's absolutely no doubt, and they've proved it has done. But as Philippa and others will know now, that's an old-fashioned design for a very rare disease, and people hopefully are, are better now and think of more modern designs than, than we got stuck with in 2016. So, so we have that design, and I'll explain a bit more about it in a moment. There are side effects. There are side effects to every medicine, whatever you do. Uh, there are common ones that affect more than one people, and uncommon ones and rare ones. Common ones, it can cause some hair loss, it can cause tummy aches, um, and sometimes it can actually make you feel a bit sick or, or uh, impaired concentration. Rarer things can be kidney problems, very rare things, uh, liver dysfunction. Most importantly, you must not give it in pregnancy. So anybody taking part in the clinical trial of, of, of reproductive age had to make absolutely certain that they were not going to get pregnant as part of it, because that, that would be an absolute disaster, because it can affect the unborn baby. So, what we asked people to take part in and do, uh, with the support of the Medicines Agency, we designed it as a two-arm, what's called double-blind pivotal trial. That means all the information for data marketing authorization is in the one trial, all collected together. We knew we needed between 60 and 70 people, but we tried to bias it so that more people would be allocated to the treatment than the dummy medicine. So it's two to one, Ratio for every one person who has dummy medicine, two people get placebo. Uh, sorry, two people get the, the sodium evaporate at that point. Um, get done on a toss of a coin, effectively, or done at random, and both the doctors and the participants are not allowed to know which medicine that they're on to take part. And to get to 70 patients, we needed to do it in Birmingham, two centres. Uh, so Renica is leaving the children's hospital site, and Dr. Ben Wright is using the, uh, the adult site. Uh, Hema Esteban is leading it in, in Spain. Uh, in France, there are two sites, Christophe Bolsord in Paris and Agatha Roberti in Montpellier. And in Poland, uh, Wojciech Monarski, a Malpasy number there, in, in which he's, he's doing it there. We had to get a clinical trials unit to get it set up, and then we had to go to the regulatory authorities in each of those four countries, and we had to get those regulatory authorities to put it through their ethics committees, and then, and then get their national coordinating centres to set up those sites and oversee it in those countries. And then because of bloody Brexit, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. it created an adult, a, a, a added, added um, uh, block in that um, the European Union and the British um, country do not <coughs> recognise each other's regulations now. So we had to have a, a drug distribution site in the UK for the UK patients and a drug distribution site in, um, in Germany for the European sites. And because Birmingham was sponsoring the trial, we had to have a sponsor within the European Union, which is in the Republic of Ireland. So um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm, I'm no fan of Brexit for rare disease clinical trials, but we managed to get through those barriers and done that, and we've now got all these sites set up to deliver Wolfram clinical trials for this one and in the future as well. So how's the clinical trial going? That's the critical bit at the moment. Um, so having got through that, we've done the sponsor, prepared all the trial documents, managed to get funding from the UK Medical Research Council to do this, which was great. Uh, got, the, got the approvals, got the trial indemnified with insurance, got contracts with drug companies to get that done, manufactured a, a dummy medicine, tested its stability and shown it was stable as well. Um, had to do the same for sodium valparate because although the drug companies that make it say they're interested, they're such big enterprises like Pfizer they're really not interested in its application for a disease as rare as Wolfram. They're much more interested in common epilepsy. 
So we had to outsource it to a different company and then show those tablets were stable outside their packaging. And all that took a long time to do. However, the first site was set up in January 2019 at the Children's Hospital, and, and Renica was very kindly leading those, those patients and that recruitment on that side. Um, you've, you've, you've put up with a lot of, of hassle on that side, Renica, over the time, and done so, but I'm very glad that you've stuck in there as well. And then, uh, then the second site was started in the University Hospital of Birmingham, and the European Union sites wouldn't start until they knew what was going to be the outcome of the Brexit negotiations. So we had to get through those and sort that out, and that's when Boris Johnson became government, and then they finally signed it off, I think, at the end of 2019, and then the European Union sites could get set up. And then we got to 2020, and then COVID hit at that point. And then we had hospitals suspending their research activities or cutting them back to deal with the COVID emergency in the outbreak as well. So there were centres in Europe that thankfully were able to start by about September 2020, but that put another six to nine month delay in at that stage. So there was a number of uh, delays to getting it set up. However, 77 people have been consented to take part in the trial across Europe. We've been able to recruit to the trial six to three of those, so we've got enough people to give a definite answer at the end of the trial, does it work or doesn't it work? So they didn't all, get, they didn't all become eligible because some of the people who consented had other things going on, or sadly, because it took so long to get the trial set up, their vision had gone beyond where we could measure it, and therefore, unfortunately, we weren't able to recruit everybody we'd like to have done. And, and that's a, a, a tragedy for, for, the, for, 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 for delivering this sort of trial. We wanted to do it much quicker, really. Um, the age range is six. Six is the youngest, about 60 years is the oldest. So there's a good bunch of children and uh, adults all the way through to 16 in there. And the average age is about 18. So a lot of young adults, like people who are here today as well. Um, more males than females, I don't know why at that point, but, but quite a few, but there's enough of both so that the results will be applicable to males and females. And you can see in the UK, um, Re Renick has recruited 14 at the Children's, um, Ben has recruited 11 at the Queen Elizabeth, these are the adults. In France, uh, 15 patients across two sites there. Uh, Paris is mainly adults, Montpellier is more children. Spain, Hema Esteban has done brilliantly and recruited 18 people to take part of this, so absolutely fantastic. And Poland, five people who recruited very, very quickly. So that, that, was, that was great. Most of those people are still in follow-up. The people who were first recruited have now completed the trial and we're waiting to, to the end one. The last patient to be recruited was in October of last year and the intervention period is three years, so the trial will finish two years from now. So we're, we're just over two thirds of the way through this clinical trial, um, and it's and it's it's a lot. It's a long trial, but as I said, two years from now will be the end of it. The only people who can see the results are the Independent Data Monitoring Committee, and this is chaired by Professor Karen Morrison, who some of you will know because she delivered the Adult Wolfram Clinic for a number of years, and she and the statistician are looking at the results every six months and they can see who's on the treatment, who's not on the treatment, and what's happening to the vision. They've got the power to stop the trial if there's absolutely no evidence or way that it's going to work, or if it's absolutely unsafe or some awful thing has happened to anybody, or the results are so fantastic that there's no point carrying on, it's such a clear it's a difference. None of those things have happened, and I, I, I'm reassured really that there's no major safety concerns and there's no evidence of the trial being futile. Uh, and therefore they've given us, they check it every six months and they give us permission to carry on unless there's any other problem from it. I, I, I wasn't expecting a miracle cure, but we are hoping to see that difference at the end of it and slowing down of the condition. Um, and it's really important for the UK to have a massive thank you for John, Tracy, Paul and others uh, and the work done by Wolfenstein in the UK that have made this trial possible for people to take part by supporting with accommodation and travel, um, and, and just all the things that make it easier for people to take part here as well. So we're really, really grateful, John and Paul, a absolutely. That's right. um, this is where families are from. So we've got 38 white Europeans who are taking part in this. Four people from the Middle East, a couple from Africa, one from North America, um, quite a lot from South Asian origin, a couple of Chinese, and then there's others that, that, that sort of mix race all together. That's very reassuring as well, because if the, if the trial shows the medicine is effective, 
Um, it, it's effective across a broad spread of different populations and ethnic groups and should be basically benefit the whole Wolfram community from that point. So that's helpful. And where are we now? So, so the remaining participants in the trial, and I think there's two, there's three left in Birmingham Children's, I think, are visiting every six months for an eye check. So everybody's going to get eight eye checks over the course of the, the three years, because that's the main thing we're looking at as an outcome. Every 12 months, they're having a brain MRI. According to Professor Tammy Hershey's instructions, so we're following exactly her protocol, so that this data can be shared with St. Louis data at the end of it, and also, um, if we can see any evidence of the brain MRI slowing down the shrinking of the brain stem, we should pick that up as a signal in, in this trial as well. And then, because it's a one-off trial, trying to do everything in it, we clear pleasing diaries for treatment, to make sure people are taking the treatment, for mood, to see whether the medicine is having any effect on mood, general well-being, um, sleep, sleep questionnaires, the ones that Best Marshall gave us for, from the states as well, bladder function, so as well as measuring it, we're trying to see is there any effect on any of these other complications of Wolfram as well. And then of course there's safety blood tests. So for every participant gets a measurement of drug levels in there, we're not allowed to see those measurements, otherwise we know who's on, on, on the treatment. But they're, they're, they're kept back so that at the end of it, the data monitoring committee can check are people taking the medicine and that nobody in the dummy group is taking the medicine as well. That's where it's at. Um, so at the end of the trial, the end of the trial will come this time in two years' time, autumn 2024, at that point. Um, that will be when the last patient has the last visit and will have got through all 63 participants that we've got. Um, all the data then gets collected. Any outstanding data from the centres, whether it's MRIs or glucose tolerance tests or questionnaires or whatever, that will all be pulled together. And an initial report looking at the effect on vision will be coming out in late 2024. And that will be the first indication about is this medicine effective about slowing down the rate of vision loss. Um, and that has to be put in a report to the community and of course to the funders, the Medical um, Research um, Council. And then after that, we'll then look at all the other outcomes on all the other aspects as well. If that shows it works, and, and the study is powered at what's called 80% power, um, to a 5% significance to, to detect a result. If it works, we then apply to the European Medicines Agency and the FDA as well to have it licensed for use in Wolfram and because we've had the EMA's advice through this we're hoping that that should be relatively straightforward because we've collected all the right information in there as well and if it's licensed for Wolfram then every doctor can prescribe it to eligible people to do so and if we can get to that stage it's a really cheap medicine it's really not expensive so it should be available for anybody who needs it at that point but it's a long slow long-winded process but we have to prove it works um, if we want to get it licensed to do so. <coughs> so that's it. So to finish, I was going to briefly talk about what other trials are going on for new treatments that are there. And there's just a couple of others that I wanted to mention on, on this side of the Atlantic that, to do. So the first one is a clinical trial that's started in France. It's called Audio Wolf. And this is really to give people with Wolfram who are not eligible for the Trigal from trial, an opportunity to try sodium valparate, and the outcome measure is hearing. So they're specifically looking to see if sodium valparate can slow down any hearing loss in people as well. It's many adults who, 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 who've got poorer vision. It's being run from Paris. Uh, they're recruiting between 30 and 40 participants, I think, in that. And Christophe Orsold and Mark Pashansky are leading that at the moment. They're still currently recruiting but it's got a shorter time scale. It's only an intervention for about a year to 18 months. So those results should come out at a similar time to the Trig Wolfram one. Um, so that, that will be a valuable additional information to have. And then uh, my colleague Pietro Maffei in University of Padua in Italy has, has managed to pull together a group of researchers, including Renica and myself in the UK, to apply to the European Union for a grant uh, to try and have a look at liraglutide to treat Wolfram and other rare diseases. And he's been able to get Wolfram drug designation for liraglutide and Wolfram, which is the first step. And this will be involving Italy, Germany, Spain, France, UK, and Portugal um, in, in a trial where uh, a new design of a study, so instead of a randomized controlled trial, a 
it could be a multi-arm study with one arm with Wolfram, another arm with um, Violet Beetle, another arm with Alstrom, and then a separate control group. Um, we hope to hear about whether the funding is successful at Christmas of this year, and if it is, after a period of negotiations, we'll probably start, this is going to take, before the clinical trial starts, it'll be about summer 2024. So it'll be pretty much when the treatment Wolfram trial finishes. Uh, and we'll find out about this one in 2022. But it, it's a big consortium of, of people being able to recruit enough patients to do that. So hopefully that, that will give another, another opportunity as well. Uh, and those of you, I think, who were at the um, International Wolf Conference last week uh, heard about Fumi Arana's plans with Amelix and others to look at a commercial trial of some of the other agents I talked about as well. So um, I, I think it's really reassuring that this doesn't all end with one trial on this side of the Atlantic. Um, there's a series of trials that will be coming, uh, and new, new treatments, hopefully, so that in the next five years, there'll be several treatment options as well. So the people that are really important to acknowledge in this is the clinical trials team led by the, the, the clinical trials units in Birmingham, Dan Barton and Ruth Evans, and our statistician in Victoria, who I, I'm not allowed to talk to too much because she's the only person who knows who's on the treatments and who's not. Uh, so she's following up the committee. Um, my fantastic clinical colleague, Raj Gupta, who's come to this conference before. He's our children's neurology doctor, who's great. Unfortunately, he's in India this week, so that's why he's not here. Renika, who is, thankfully, and has borne with this trial over thick and thin over the last couple of years as well and, and kept the children going through this here. The people who are looking after the imaging now, Martin Wilson, um, and Andrew Cooper, who's coordinated on our side. And then on, on the research side, the neurology nurses, uh, uh, Sarah Harris, uh, Sarah and Amy on the adult side, some of you will know, and Michelle and Rachel on the children's side. Uh, the trial steering committee, international committee, so Mark Kachonsky from France is chairing that and looking after that. And the international collaborators who are recruiting the patients across the country. And massive thanks, as I said, to Tammy, particularly, but also Bess and Fumi, for, sharing, for generously sharing the data, without which we wouldn't have been able to get this trial off the ground, which has been really helpful. And then Tracy, who sadly is not here at the moment, but has done a fantastic job in supporting us with the funding to actually keep the trial going here for families to do so. And then the French Wolfram I Hope and Snow Foundation, without whose support we wouldn't have been able to collect the, the trial specimens and the things that will be available from all these patients for the whole community at the end of this trial that's going to be available, including the MR scans and support to collect that as well at that point, and then our laboratory team. And then the clinical service team to keep the families going, which is Marie and Susan and others who are here as well, so, so keeping the clinical service going uh, in, in spite of the trial intervening with it. So I think that's about as far as I wanted to go. Um, I hope that gives you an update about where we are. But also, it's not the end of the road. It's not all going to stop with this trial. There's other trials planned in the future, both on this side of the Atlantic and in North America as well. And it's a long journey, and you're all taking part in it, and we're really grateful for your support to do so. So I'll stop at that. Thank you.